I guess I'll get, get, I'll get started now. It's about three. Um, so this, this presentation is on data flow. Um, it's basically uh, a way to program in eventually the um, declarative concurrent model. I don't mean eventually as in the library can't do it. I mean eventually as in I'll get there explaining it. Um, and it's not very well known, um, but I'll show you some references if you want to read up further about it at the end of the presentation. So this is me. I work on Engineering Cloud. Um, I use Layers of Liquid for pretty much everything. Uh, all right, so this is sort of the outline. Um, basically, at first I'm just going to talk about the purpose of why I'm giving this presentation and sort of created this library. And then uh, I'm going to gradually explain the concepts, which is going to start sort of on a basic uh, sort of programming, not, not super basic fundamentals, but at least theory, and then expand from there. But don't worry, because it gets into really cool stuff. Um, and at the end, I'll just have some tips. OK, so, so the purpose. Uh, this, sometimes I just pick images that don't really mean anything. But um, the, the, the purpose of this basically is, um, you know, Ruby kind of had its uh, success early on, both uh, well, pre-Rails, just having like a pretty good hacker community around it and like people doing pretty innovative stuff. And then post-Rails, um, of course, you had a big influx of people and um, you know, people were pretty happy, like, oh yeah, Ruby you know, won, it's awesome. Like, go give talks about Ruby because it's so cool and you can do all these things with it. And um, that, I at least in my perspective, seemed to die down a little bit um, more recently, or at least a little bit after Rails became kind of the, the norm. And at this point, we, we, have, we, you know, we do have other languages that have copied Rails or Ruby's um, useful libraries, both like test libraries, web frameworks, that kind of thing. And um, we also have languages um, such as like Clojure and Haskell and Erlang and you know whatnot that are sort of innovating um, in pretty cool ways. And I think part of that is because they, they still have relatively small user bases. Um, so you don't have a lot of backwards compatibility problems like you would. Uh, I mean, you know, Ruby is getting to be a decently big community right now, so you have a lot of people depending on like old versions of libraries and stuff like that. But um, I, I, I kind of want to encourage more people to just try to play around with ideas, other programming paradigms that are kind of similar. You know, in, in the same vein, vein as Dataflow, to sort of keep. Um, the the community keep the the hackers in the Ruby community instead of like letting them leak out into other communities where really cool innovation is happening. Not that that's not happening in Ruby, but you know just you don't want to just rest in your success, right? Um, so that's kind of the purpose, pretty much. Okay, so we're going to start out here with just uh, talking about lexical scope. So in lexical scope, you can see here we have a variable, and then we define a method. And uh, the method closes over the variable. And the, the really useful thing to note here is that you can look at this method definition. It doesn't matter if it's defined inside of a class or if it's in a module mixed into any other class. You can look at this and always know what it returns. Um, and that's a really powerful property because you can look at the line of source or, or the, the, the lines of source code in one place and not really have to worry about them changing from underneath you. Um, whereas, um, so traditionally, dynamic scope, um, if, if you're familiar with like list communities or some, or stuff like that, it, it's it's more talked about in those communities where you have um, basically a, a block of scope that's reassigning a variable used inside of it. It's kind of the default scoping model by languages um, used originally before people learned that it pretty much sucks. And um, if you, you can kind of view um, object orientation and the way instance variables are used as a sort of dynamic scope in the sense that um, the block or your, your current environment is the object state, right? So when you look at this method definition, 
Um, it, it might seem like a very simple definition, and you know, everyone of course knows what it does, but in fact at runtime you have no idea what it returns. And um, w when, you, when you really step back and start to just meditate on this a little bit, it's actually kind of scary that like, this really, really simple piece of code has so much underlying complexity that like, you, can't, you can't tell any, you, you, don't ha you have no idea what it's going to return. If it's, if it's mixed in as a module to a class, that class may already have instance variables set. And if it's already in a class and other methods were called, then you know, that of course set the state or didn't set the state or whatnot. So it's kind of, um, as Verbius, we're used to writing code like this, but um, you, you, really don't take, you really don't think much about all the mental overhead it takes to kind of get past having to track all this different state and what, what actually results from that. So there's a lot of work, and even though it may be on the back burner for you right now, like you don't really have to think about it anymore, it is still wasted cycles that um, could be spent on doing other things. And the, uh, of course, that's not um, a bad, that using this is not a bad thing, because what it does provide is modularity. And um, reasoning about the program is reduced, but in favor of modularity, right? So in functional programs, you would have, um, if you wanted to introduce something as an argument, you would have to introduce it to all the other methods that um, are, are calling this method. That way, the argument can be threaded through, right? And, and that's, that, of course, is bad, because now anytime you want to add something, you have to change all your methods, right? So it, it's, it's a trade-off, but a, a trade-off that I think, um, especially Rubyus and most like other mainstream programming language um, users should think about. So, so the, the other thing involved here that makes it harder to reason about is mutability, right? So you can, you can, be, you can see it has initialized method, and then you, you later on, after you instantiate the object, call the foo method. But you're not guaranteed it's going to return the symbol foo because any number of other methods could have been called that changed that state. So same deal. It's kind of... Um, makes reasoning a little bit harder. And now you can sort of, you know, it seems like, okay, well now we must know that this is always going to return the symbol foo. And while that's true in the synchronous world, in the concurrent world, it's not true. Because you can have something like this, right? You can have a, a thread that's in the background somewhere that's constantly changing your state to whatever. And you're like, oh, okay, this is going to return the symbol foo. Well, Right after it gets set, this thread um, starts executing and resets the variable, and then this actually returns Shazbot, which is a reference to Tribes 2. It's a pretty sweet video game. Actually, more convincing. Huh? More convincing before that. More convincing? I guess I'll have to Google that. Um, yeah, I sort of started playing video games and then stopped, but obviously I wasn't young enough to start for whatever. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a savior, and that savior <laughs> is the declarative model. <laughs> so uh, originally, uh, the declarative model in the most ideal sort of abstract sense is rather than um, writing how an algorithm works, you write um, specifications, sort of, sort of blueprints of what you want the algorithm to do, um, or to give you back, rather than how to do it, right? And uh, of course, in the most general, super awesome sense, you'd have some fancy artificial intelligence that would be able to figure out what needs to, how, how something should actually happen according to the context and stuff like that, right? But um, more conservatively in the declarative model, um, you, if your specifications themselves can actually mean something different at runtime, then how in the world are you going to be able to implement an algorithm for that? And that's, that's why when you have declarative programming, you start talking about you know, mutable state. 
and you, how immutable state is not a part, part of that, and how, how your programs want to remain uh, referentially transparent, which basically means that um, you can do value substitution based on the arguments that gets pa get passed in. So every time something is called, you always know it's going to return the same thing. Um, and this, um, so the declarative model in general is sort of, uh, well, it, it is a superset uh, of a model that includes functional programming within it. Um, so that, of course, applies to functioning, uh, functional programming as well, and that's why you hear uh, people talking about referential transparency in, in functional programming worlds. Um, but it is more general than that. And um, I might get in, I might mention why that's so later, but maybe not. It's not really, it's, it's a subtle detail, not really that important. Um, so first of all, what we're going to do here is show, we're going to step back from concurrency, the idea of concurrency, and just deal with declarative synchronous programming, right? So if any of you have dealt with like more, you know, more towards the edge of purely functional languages, then you'll notice that you're not allowed to rebind variables once you set them, right? So we set my var to bound, then we set it to rebind, but now we're out of the declarative model. So that's not allowed in a language like Erlang or something. You'd get in run a runtime error, and it's, uh, you can't do that. Now, um, okay, so here, here a few new concepts are introduced. We have this idea, um, and just so you know, this, it, uh, up here there's an implicit include data flow to give me these methods at the root level, right? Um, so we have this local method, and you might not be used to declaring variables before you use them, especially, you know, you might be like, oh, that's a static language thing, like who does that, right? Well, it actually turns out that it's actually really cool and really useful even in dynamic languages. Um, so we, declare, we, we say local, we declare my var, and then um, we call a method on it, right? Except what is my var? It's an undeclared uh, variable. Um, so in other languages, such as in Java, if you do something like this, you would get an ex uh, exception or runtime error or something like that. It wouldn't be allowed. And in C++, it's actually pretty interesting because you just get um, a pointer to a random, uh, a random reference to memory. So you have no idea where you're going to get back. It's kind of like Russian roulette. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And in uh, data flow, what happens is the thread sleeps. Now that's pretty useless in a synchronous model, but as we'll see later, it's really powerful in a concurrent model. So, of course, we can't like change Ruby, right? We can't have the equal statement um, not allow you to reassign variables. That would break a lot of things and not be very Ruby-ish. Um, and also, just stepping back a bit, I, um, you know, Ruby's mutability is what allowed it to succeed. Um, and what, what allowed frameworks like Rails and you know, Active Record, it makes those kind of things possible. So I'm not attacking those concepts. I'm just saying that people should um, try to think about problems in uh, so, sort of in the sense of what, what, you know, what paradigm makes sense for the certain problem. And you don't have to start at this really complex to reason about, super mutable. Um, sort of Ruby implementation of OO and metaprogramming level, you can start at a really nice, you know, declarative model and then work your way up as the problem needs be. And th th those ideas are um, taken from a programming language called Oz. If you Google for Mozart Oz, that's where all of this comes for. Like the, almost the entire presentation, everything directly copied from this obscure language called Oz. It's it's really cool. Um, but anyways, okay, back 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 on track here. Um, we're not going to use equals because Ruby wouldn't uh, make sure our semantics get followed correctly. So we're going to use unify, right? So we have unify, uh, my var bounds. Now unify may seem kind of weird. You can sort of think, uh, uh, instead of seeing unify, kind of think bind, right? So this is like my var equals bound. Um, in, um, I'm not, sh I kind of use the word unify because I may implement more complex uh, pattern matching uh, sort of ability into the library later on that would allow you to do like, you know, match match partially across unification and stuff like that. But um, j basically, just think of it as setting 
um, the left side equal to the right side for now, but realize it's much more powerful conceptually. So um, then we unify again and we try to rebind it, but now we get this, uh, I guess you can't see the comments very well, but you get a data flow, data flow unification error. Um, <coughs> bound is not equal to rebind, right? So that's not allowed. And of course you could sort of skip this safety mechanism by just resetting the variable yourself. So in order to remain in this declarative model, you have to go through its declarative interface. Um, but um, you know that's not a bad thing because it allows you to use both models. So you can again um, choose something that choose a model appropriate to the problem. This is just an alternate syntax for instance variables. You can you know declare my var. It's kind of like an adder reader basically, except it can be unified. So you declare my var and then unify it. And if you access my var, it's actually a method call, but it kind of looks like the same syntax. You know, same way that adder reader works. And now uh, we're going to go into the declar declarative concurrent model. And this is where things get really interesting. It sort of, it sort of seems like magic. Like it's, it's a really, it, when you see it, it's really exciting like what sorts of stuff actually is happening in the back end. Now this is uh, from uh, the cover of SIGP. It's not actually, it, this book doesn't actually use um, data flow, but it has a wizard, so magic kind of makes sense. <laughs> Um, we'll hope that data flow is as powerful as Lambda, maybe, probably not, but it's cool. Um, so now you'll see that, um, okay, he, here's the other really important point that I want to make, especially for the Ruby community, right? So in Ruby, everyone's uh, really well known for being test heavy. Like everyone's like, oh yeah, let's test everything. And I, I personally think that's great, especially because of mutability of the language, but even, even if you're not considering mutability, you still want to at least integration test to make sure your end result is equal to what you want it to be, right? So what a, a really cool feature of Dataflow is that it allows you to thread inside your specs and also spec threaded code. Now normally, whenever you deal with threaded code, most of the time, you're gonna like mock it to be synchronous because you don't want to deal with you know, all the different paths that can happen and it, you're, 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 you're delaying something in a thread and you don't want to have to, like, how do you intercept the result? You're just like, ah, oh, whatever, it'll just be synchronous and you mock it out and stub it or whatever, right? So in Dataflow, you don't have to do that. So you can actually test the concurrent threaded code that, that's actually going to be running in production. Um, so what happens here is we start a new thread and in that thread, we're going to unify my var to bound. But um, that thread's executing, so let's say the scheduler stopped it, and it's, you know, it's gonna do this, it's gonna reschedule it like five minutes later, because let's pretend it's like really dumb or something, right? So we do my var dot should. Well, in um, the Ruby implementation of Dataflow, method calls are a form of activation. Um, so, my var is going to suspend because it's not yet declared, right? So the, the calling thread just sleeps. And then whenever that unification happens, it wakes it back up, assigns it the value, and now this is true. Um, this is a very simple example, but you can do really cool stuff with this, right? So we're going to assert that our sentence ends up being all your base are belong to us. And we're going to start three threads, and basically there's... Uh, sort of, um, uh, there, there's different relations between these ver various variables, right? So your middle is going to um, use your tail, your tail doesn't use anything, and um, sentence uses your middle. So all the dependencies are automatically resolved for you and end up passing. And because we're remaining in the declarative model, Every, it, it, as long as we write a test and get it passing once, we know that it's going to pass all the time. So there's no concept of race conditions. That's really powerful. Now, if you would do something that would leave the declared model, then of course you're going you're to shoot yourself in the foot. But um, question? Uh, which one didn't wasn't it in? Like, oops, one more forward. 
This one? Yeah. Oh, well, the, the only reason it wasn't here is because I declared it as it's sort of like an adder reader, okay. right? So it's kind of like adder reader versus just doing more like imperative style code that's just like in line. You're just like creating a scope basically. Okay. And it just creates an unbound variable. So it's just like a fresh variable, right? If you try to access it, the calling thread suspends. Um, and then whenever it does get bound, then it'll resume again. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that'll actually turn into two string calls. So the cool thing about Ruby is that a lot of like syntax features actually get turned into method calls. So anything that ends up being a um, method call will work with this library. Of course, if you have something like a true keyword, like defined question mark, that isn't going to do anything, right? So that's that's going to go right. So implement internally, this is implemented with a proxy. And it proxies all the methods through. So if you have a defined, it's not, you know, Ruby interpreter is going to be like, oh, well, I'm going to tell you what this is. It's an expression or whatever, right? But for most things, the cool thing is that Ruby is sort of built around this uh, common interface that almost everything ends up being a method call, even though there's syntax sugar around it. You, you can sort of think of it as like a, as like a, a precompiler that actually turns it into method calls. Conceptually, yeah. How do you handle things like, you know, deadlock, like if that third thread never returns? Um, so, so, so if the third thread never occurs, then um, your calling thread will just, I mean, nothing, it'll just hang there, right? But um, that's why you test, right? Because if, if, you're, if your tests ever work once, they're always going to work the same way. So if there's like some error in the logic inside of that thread and it raises an exception such that the other ones never end up um, unifying correctly, then your test will just hang and you could write a helper around your test that would do like a timeout or something, right? So that's why the tests are important. As long as you get your t a test passing once, you're always golden. Um, so another cool application of this is um, to do asynchronous work. So if any of you ever have you ever used Merb, there's a thing called like uh, run later, right? So you basically you have run later and, it's, and you pass it a block and you do some code that you don't want to run inside of the request. But how do you know what's the result of that code? Well, the cool thing is um, you can actually um, pass. Um, so so in, in the C++ world, there's this concept of passing references to methods. And you know, some people, Rubyists might cringe and be like, oh, you know, references, passing those a method, just return stuff, that sucks, right? Well, the, the reason why it sucks is because those references are dealing with memory directly. So it's not going to be declarative, right? Because anyone can write to that memory. But it's actually not a bad thing. So what you can do here is if you look at this call, we say worker.async, and we pass it a freshly created data flow variable, right? And what the worker's going to do is spawn off a new thread, calculate the result, and then unify the data flow variable that we passed in to the result. So you can, you can have like work being done in an asynchronous manner, and then your tests will get notified whenever the result is ready to be verified. And you, you know, in this case, I did like uh, worker.async output equals nil, so I turned it to nil as a default parameter. That way, in production, if you don't want to verify results, you don't have to. So th it's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, now, here's a little abstraction around this. This isn't in the library right now, but it's on my local hard drive. It'll probably be there tomorrow morning. Um, it's, it's something called flow. It's basically an abstraction around threads. So if you wanted to like override it with a thread pool or something, you could do that. Um, but what, what it allows you to do is pass in that variable and as Rubyists, we're kind of used to the idea that method calls will return the, the last, whatever is on the last line, right? So in, in, in the same way, you can have an asynchronous action, and it's going to you know, return what happened on the last line. So you do all your stuff, and then the end result gets bound to the output variable, and you can just assert it. So um, as you can see, like, you, you start to be able to build like, these really cool um, abstractions around this really simple concept. Um, here's another example. So we can also have anonymous variables, right? 
So rather than using that local thing, if, if, we're, if we're dealing with a, an existing Ruby data structure and we just want to fill it with stuff, then we can use dataflow variable dot new, right? Because um, they're just objects, sure. So we, we have these keys and values. We map across them with uh, domain and var for key and value. And then we create a, a, a new thread for each iteration of the map. And in that new thread, we're going to make an HTTP request call and um, then just end up returning the uh, variable. Um, so what this will basically let you do is um, issue two HTTP requests at once. Um, so th this might be a little bit, um, I mean, it, it's so little code and it's like an awesome abstraction, so why not take it a little bit further, right? So now uh, this already exists in the current version of Dataflow. It's called need later. I think this is probably going to be the most used uh, method in the library. Um, basically what it does is you can give it a block and it returns to you uh, a, a future, right? So it returns to you a data flow variable and then you can do whatever you want with that data flow variable and then whenever you try to access, you know, get, you know, call methods on it, then it'll actually suspend or if it's already been bound, just work. So it, this is a super powerful abstraction. It's really cool. Does that make sense to everybody? That abstraction? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and you can see, like, it, you know, it just fits in the line. Like, there's really cool stuff happening there. Okay, so um, here's chunk sequential processing, right? So we, we have this array of 100 items. We're going to slice that array up by 10. We're using, like, uh, you know, Ruby 19187 enumerator syntax so we can just slice something up within each and then map after it. Um, so we have um, basically 10. Uh, chunks, 10 chunks of 10 items, and we're just going to sleep one just for an example, right? But you could do like heavy computation in here or whatever you want. And then we're going to add up all the things in the little sub chunk, and then uh, in, in the end, add up everything um, out of the results of each of the 10 you know, groups. And if you time this, that takes about 10 seconds. But if you wrap a need later around it, it takes about one second. So, you know, you can get, like, awesome um, concurrency. Pre I mean, it almost feels like for free. Um, you know, it's where I, what I was talking about before. Like, it almost seems like, like magic a little bit. Um, okay, so this is a matrix reference. So we're going to leave the declarative model and extend it a little bit with um, the ability to use, uh, to, to do asynchronous stuff because the, while declarative model is staying in there, you should do it as much as you can, uh, and, and it's powerful. It can't handle, uh, for example, a client-server scenario because you don't know beforehand um, what clients are going to connect to you. They can connect to you at any time, right? There's an inherent race condition in the client-server model. So we can extend data flow or declarative concurrency by just a little bit, putting just a little bit of state in there with this concept of ports. Um, so what a port is, uh, a port is um, basically something you can send message, messages to and you initialize it with a new unbound data flow variable that'll get bound internally as a stream. And the stream is sort of like a con cell. It's basically like a linked list of um, data flow, a data flow variable head and then another stream tail, right? So we're gonna take our port and it sit, here's an asynchronous example. It's not that interesting. We send one, we send two, and then if we take um, two from the stream, it should equal that array. And, um, you know, that's fine, whatever, but it becomes cooler when we deal with it in an asynchronous fashion. So here's basically um, a little echo server that we have, and we, um, you know, create our new port, start up a new thread, and then we're gonna each, um, so, so streams are enumerable, um, so we're going to each over the thread and then print out whenever we receive a, receive a message. And then we're going to um, go over, um, so that, this should have a W here. We're going to go over an array of X, Y, and Z and each over that. And inside of a new thread, we're going to send a letter, right? What that means is when we take all the stuff that we sent, there was a race condition there, so we, we're not sure when we actually um, 
uh, what, what the actual order that it appeared in is. But um, so, so that can make testing a little bit more difficult because you have to know kind of the problem a little bit more. In this case, it's really easy because we'll just sort afterwards and you, know, you, you get the correct output all the time. Uh, but again, you know, this is outside a little bit of the declarative model, so you don't have all the same guarantees, but it's still, it still it, it enables you to do the client-server model. Another cool thing you can do, um, now this is one of my personal favorites, is this idea of a future queue, right? So we're all familiar with the queue that you can like push and pop from, right? Here, we're gonna unify queue to a future queue, a new future queue, and then we're going to pop stuff off the queue before it even exists. So you're like using stuff, you're popping stuff off a queue that isn't even there yet, right? And then we push stuff onto it, and, you know, and then we do like a regular synchronous push pop. And basically, whenever something comes in, the, the one will get bound to the first, and then the two will get bound to the second. So it's, it's, it's really, it's kind of weird when you first think about it. It's like, you know, whoa, like, well, what's going on here? But it's, it's pretty cool. And this is like the kind of cool abstraction that you can build with Dataflow. I don't know if this is useful. So uh, in my local copy, in my local copy, I've only included this as an example file rather than a library class. Um, Sure. If you, if, if you like it, I can put it in the library. It's right, right now it's an example file, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. If we have time, I'll show the source code because it fits on a slide at the end. Um, so yeah, this is cool. And um, you know, at, first it might be, at first you might think, oh, this is weird. But really, it's kind of the way we think already, right? Let's say you're, you're at an ice cream shop. You have to stand in line, and you grab like a ticket, right? So now you have your ticket. And then what are you going to do? You're going to go talk to your friends, and then whatever, whenever the line's done, you're going to go get it. Or you're going to stand in line, and now you're bound there sleeping. Your thread sleeps, and you're waiting until it's your turn, right? So it's, it's kind of the same way. Like, you pop that ticket off the queue, and eventually, it, you know, it's your standard, like, customer service line queue example. It's a, it's a queue, but it's a future queue. It's pretty cool. But, but in this example, doesn't, don't you block? No, you do not, because it's implemented with uh, ports rather than data flow variables. And I'll show you the implementation later. Okay, that, that makes my brain itch. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so another cool thing is, you know, we built um, ports on top of data flow. Now we're going to build actors, Erlang style actors, on top of ports. So you can look at these little actors, and if you squint hard enough, it kind of looks like Erlang. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, we have a ping and a pong, and then we're in a case on receive. Receive is actually a method call that's, you know, an actor subclass is thread. So that's how that method call happens. The receive will get used by the case statement and then do the messages. And then you start off the chain by sending ping, and it'll go, you know, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Um, so it's pretty cool. And um, so this is, um, so. CTM, the um, book that all this Oz stuff and really cool programming ideas is based off, uh, I got in touch with the author like after I wrote this library. And I'm like, hey, cool, look, you know, I have like a, a Ruby library that uses your ideas. Like, that can actually be used now. Like, <laughs> so um, he was pretty happy. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, you should implement laziness too, because laziness fits in with declarative concurrency really well, really elegantly. So I'm like, OK. It's just like three lines of code, so whatever. Um, so we, we have a might get used, and we set it equal to a by need. Now everyone's familiar with laziness, so sorry to bore you, but like he wanted this in, so I'm just like, yeah, all right, whatever. Um, so then we do might get used, and if it's an even number, then we'll use it. Otherwise, it won't. The cool thing is that this actually internally uses data flow variables, right? So um, it actually fits in the declarative model, so you can have a by need, and then you can unify to it, and you'll get a unification error if those two end up not equaling. And if they do equal, you won't. Uh, don't ask me why that's useful, but it fits in the model very nicely together. So um, it's, it's 
pretty cool the way, like, once you start looking at all this stuff, how it all, it all matches. It's like a puzzle. Like, it all works together. It's pretty awesome. All right, so now we're going to get to tips. Um, so this is another really cool thing about this library. And it goes back to the stuff I talked about originally with um, you know, what uh, Yehuda asked as far as like you have the string interpolation going on that delegates to a method call. And it just feels like, you know, it's, it feels like data flow variables are like part of the language, right? It's like, oh yeah, like data flow is part of like Ruby, right? Um, and that's because of Ruby's interface of, you know, just delegating everything to methods, which is really awesome. So in our library, we can just say, uh, you know, as Rubyist, my var should equal bound. But if you look at, so as soon as I released this, there were like Groovy, Scala, and Python copies of the library. But in all of their libraries, they'll have something like this. They'll have myvar.wait, right? Because they don't have a uniform interface like that. What that means is all their code is not going to be modular. So you have all these libraries, like you have the Ruby standard library, any gem that you have, whatever. You can just take a need later block and pass stuff to it. And then, or like a by need block and pass stuff to it, and it'll all just work because it's all using the same interface. So you 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 maintain modularity, whereas all these other libraries are going to have to rewrite all their code in order to support data flow, unless they write new code. But you know, so that's really cool. Another thing, just like little tidbits, um, if if you want to debug, you know, originally like. Somebody wrote a post about this library, and he's like, oh, yeah, it sucks for debugging, because my debugger will end up having the thread get suspended when it's trying to inspect the variables. Um, so I, 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 since inspect hopefully isn't used for any sort of logical purpose, um, I, I have a special method on the proxy called inspect that'll give you a data flow variable unbound. Um, and then I just, this is uh, the ID, the underscore underscore ID that isn't overwritten by the proxy is included here. So you can keep track of stuff uh, if you have a complex situation, uh, you know, just for convenience. So that will be in by tomorrow too. But the regular message without the ID is already there. Um, the other thing I have locally is, in case you don't want to like include and like overwrite, like if you already, already defined local or whatever, then you can just you know call it on data flow, the module, and um, it's kind of ugly, so you should just include it. But you know, it's there for people want it. Um, okay, use cases. So if you want like general, uh, if you want to have like a nice architecture as far as or a nice uh, order of program execution, um, and you want it to automatically just resolve at runtime, like it, this is especially apparent for um, if you have like a game. Like my friend uh, forked this library on GitHub, and he has an example of doing a he, he used DRB and Dataflow to write a little rock, paper, scissors client. And um, that uh, he'll basically like, set up all the different conditions in new, thread, in new threads that could happen, you know, all the different combinations of rock, paper, scissors. And it makes sense, because you can just read it step by step. And then whichever one ends up getting used through, through unification binding will get resolved by the thread and end up working. So it's really cool for like. Uh, you know, for that, like if you have like a complex UI or something, you're just like, oh, I don't want to deal with like all this like on-click hook garbage. Like, just set up threads, and then they'll just get end up getting used whenever they're needed. Another cool thing is if you want to use uh, like that that chunked that parallel chunk processing example I showed. Like, I did an example of that with JRuby, and I got like a free like 40% improvement on like adding up, you know, billions of numbers or something like that. So that's cool. Um, and, and you know, of course, that only would work on JRuby or now, I guess, MacRuby once it's fully supported because they don't have gills. Um, but you can still use this library if you want to uh, get rid of latency problems, which is you know, most people do web development. So we'll get into web development. Um, worker daemons, you know, you can do cool stuff in worker daemons with Dataflow, or if you're, um, you know. Most of the time, you don't want to do stuff, make web requests in, inside of existing web requests, because a server, a client server, is already an implicit concurrency model that web apps have. So you don't want to like, you know, everyone's like, oh, I need concurrency for my web apps, but you know that already exists. You can already, you know, horizontally add your servers. The, the model is already there. But um, so you probably shouldn't do this that much. But that being said, you know, concurrency is going or 
web development is going more and more towards reusing all these little REST APIs, these little microservices. So you can just issue all these need later requests, these microservices, and then you know, just render them as regular variables in the view. And the view, of course, is going to try to two-string stuff. So it'll just all work out. So that might be a cool application for web dev guys. Uh, it's pure Ruby. It'll work on anything. Uh, JRuby, awesome GC. Since you're creating an extra proxy object every time, it's nice to have a good GC for that. Um, no gil, native threads. And it, JRuby also has a tunable thread pool, pretty sweet. Uh, Rubinius, uh, it's useful for Rubinius because um, Rubinius has a lot more stuff implemented in Ruby. The key feature there is that that means there's a lot more hooks. So whenever you have like, you know, method missing is like a hook, right? So array flatten in Rubinius calls a, a hook method internally, whereas that's not true in any other implementation that does, does it natively. Um, um, so it looks like we're almost at it. Yeah, we're pretty much out of time, but you know, future queue fits in the slide. We have like two ports, one for pushing and popping, and we have a thread, and we're just looping over stuff. Barrier is a new thing. It's basically because you don't you you, you want to wait until this list. It takes a list of arguments. You want to wait until they're at least unified. That way, um, your the next unification will just bind on the result of that data flow variable. Um, it's probably too much to explain in, in like a few seconds, but trust me that it works. And um, anyway, it, it's only like a page of code and like the port example, if you look at the port source code, there's some like backwards compatibility stuff for non 187 Ruby, but it's also very little, actor is very little, data flow itself is complicated a little bit, but also very little. Um, so that's the end, you can pseudo port install data flow, you can do it tomorrow to get some of the extra niceties that I added, like hacking last night. And it's on GitHub. Um, I'm on Dataflow Gem, auto join. It's only me, if you want to talk to me. <laughs> um, and CTM, it's awesome. Like, if you want to read about a really cool programming language, it's Oz, and you'll see, you'll be like, oh man, that guy's a douche. He copied like everything from that book. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>